Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's guest on Bulletproof Radio is none other than John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods and author of a brand new book called, surprisingly, The Whole Foods Diet. (laughs) John may not need an introduction, but you might not know that in 1980, he started Whole Foods and they're now almost a $16 billion Fortune 500 company with 460 stores and almost 90,000 employees one of the 100 best companies to work for, according to Fortune. And John's been recognized as one of the world's 50 greatest leaders. Uh, Barron's called him the world's best CEO, Fortune's business person of the year, and Esquire's most inspiring CEO. So John, my first question is, how did you feel when you were in Esquire? You know, I like the, <laughs> I like the Esquire because they, they made me look good. They had, a, they had their hairstylist, and they were... They were making me look super hip and cool, which I've never been able to replicate ever since. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things if you're an Esquire, you're like, okay, no, I've, I've made it under the cool. I actually, right? believe it or not, I actually got letters after that came out. from. I got a letter from a woman in Australia saying, I look like a really interesting man she'd like to meet. Could I get together with her next time she's in Austin? <laughs> uh, didn't respond to that one. Yeah, I could see, I could see that, uh, why they wouldn't want to do that. And there's, there's a lot of cool stuff we can talk about, but what the main focus of our conversation today is, is uh, your new book. Hmm. And the Whole Foods Diet caught my attention because you went around and you talked with a, a bunch of different uh, experts and you talked about your own evolution of food and you wrote it with two physicians. Right. What made you, as a, I think the technical term is, is a, a, a very accomplished CEO, decide to write a book on on food? I mean, I've been studying it my entire adult life since for 40 years I've been studying healthy eating and I've I've had my own internal journey. But imagine for a second, Dave, that you believe that you know the solution to the health crisis in America. America is 71% overweight. It's almost 38% obese. We, the two leading killers are heart disease and cancer. And uh, diabetes is becoming almost pandemic. And you know what to do about it. It's almost an ethical uh, compunction to write a book about it. And, and it's kind of sort of a bucket list thing for me. I had, to, I had to write this book. I had to communicate it. I'm, I meet people all the time, and I feel like I know how to help them if they would just uh, change their diets. They could reverse a lot of these problems and their diseases. At Whole Foods Market, Dave, we have a program we call the Total Health Immersion. We take our sickest team members, those who are have heart disease, those who are type 2 diabetic, those who are obese, those who have terrible biometrics, extremely high cholesterol, high blood pressure, high blood sugar levels. And at the expense of the company, we will send them, uh, it's voluntary, we don't force anyone to go, but it costs us about $4,000 to send them to a one week medically supervised total health immersion. And that one week, they're eating the whole foods diet and uh, they are being intensely educated and there, we, we, about healthy eating, about exercise, about how to live a healthy lifestyle. And the results have been astounding. We sent, again, over 4,000 people through that program now. And I've seen so many people reverse their type 2 diabetes in less than four weeks. I've seen heart disease reversed. I've seen uh, hundreds of people lose over 100 pounds of weight. Yeah. And, and it's like, and it's so quickly. The human body <laughs> is actually quite resilient. Yeah. It wants to heal itself. If we stop poisoning it, it heals pretty quickly. That was my big takeaway. So I was like, well, we've got to get this information out to a much larger audience. So you said 4,000 employees? We, we've sent 4,000 through now, yeah. Okay, and so that's millions of dollars that you spent on yeah. doing this. Mm-hmm. Does it? On the other hand, think about it for a moment. That's a win-win strategy for us because we're, we pay, we're self-insured, meaning we pay most of the health care uh, cost of our, of our team mm-hmm. members. So... How much do they spend on me? Nothing. Yeah. So, I mean, about 15% of our team members, we spend about 85% of our total health care dollars. So, and so the sickest people use, so if we can right. get our, our sickest people healthier, that's good for them. And it's also good for our company. It's a win-win-win strategy. Now, 
that's something that a lot of companies don't do. In fact, it's, it's pretty unusual. Because they don't understand the whole foods diet. <laughs> if they did, they'd be doing it. And maybe, maybe I think eventually, because this does work, uh, that it will it'll spread. I, I have great belief that despite lots of false information out there, over time science wins, over time uh, uh, word of mouth spreads things. It might take generations, but eventually people will begin to eat much healthier diets and they won't have these diseases. Now, the Whole Foods diet is one that I, I support many of the tenets of it. Mm -hmm. There are some parts of it where I'm not convinced, frankly, okay. which, is, which is okay. Like, I've had lots of people on the show where we don't always agree. We're not, I'm not good for converts. Yeah. It's not a religious movement. I, I'm looking to learn here. Tell me the main tenets. And the eat mostly plants, I'm down with that. The plate of, of vegetables is a core it's, thing it's that really I do every simple. day. It's really yeah. simple. It's just two major rules. Okay. Eat real foods, and real foods are foods that are, uh, eat real whole foods, foods that have not been highly processed. Yeah. And, and f f if you think about it for a second, what is sugar? Sugar is from plants, and it is the pure carbohydrate from the plant. So it's, it doesn't have any of the fiber, it doesn't have any of the nutrients, it's basically just the pure carbohydrate, the sugar. And we don't seem to have any problem in our society recognizing that sugar is a very harmful food and we should eat very little of it or none at all. And that goes for pretty much refined carbohydrates in general. We're stripping away the fiber, we're stripping away the nutrients. So eating lots of uh, breads and, and uh, donuts and things like that, are, are those aren't real foods, they're not really healthy foods. What's more controversial and which you may take issue with is I think the same thing's true of oil. Oil is from plants. It's the pure fat from the plants. So sugar is the pure carbohydrate of the plants, and oil is the pure fat of the plants. It also lacks nutrients. It lacks micronutrients. It lacks fiber. And so uh, we would say if you're going to eat a real foods diet, you want to minimize those pure carbohydrates or those refined carbohydrates and also those pure fats. We, we, we're not against fat. We don't make an argument against fat. We think fat is, is going to be found in real foods, and uh, that's perfectly fine. So we're not arguing for it. We think he should be focused more about food rather than the macronutrients, yeah. eat this many carbs, don't eat carbs, yeah. eat carbs, eat fat, don't eat fat, eat more protein, eat less protein. No, it's about eating real foods. So that's rule number one. Rule number two is mostly plants. It's not, we're not arguing for a 100% plant-based diet unless that's uh, your personal choice. But we are arguing, we believe the science that once you begin to get your total animal food consumption up above 10% of calories on a, on a, as a lifestyle basis, that your risk for down the road, it's not like next week, mm -hmm. but down the road, your risk for heart disease and cancer begin to go up. The more animal foods you eat past a certain point, the higher your risk for those two diseases. One of the things that I run into a lot when I'm, I'm talking about the Bulletproof Diet, which people listening <laughs> may be going, what are you talking about? Like, like, is there a similarity here? There's actually enormous amounts of similarity. One of the things I, I believe is don't eat foods that won't spoil and don't eat foods that are spoiled. <laughs> I think that's very sensible <laughs> advice. <laughs> <laughs> right. And Although are fermented foods spoiled? Uh, it depends on what fermented them usually. And there right? you go. It's, a, it's an interesting question, though. It is. And it actually leads into uh, where, where I'm going with that, which is that there are different types of animal proteins, mm -hmm. and there are different types of plant oils, and different types of plant foods even, right? right? And they have different effects on the body. And I have started out my path when I weighed 300 pounds, and I would say, you know, oh, I, I need carbs for energy. There's a can of Coke. And I remember in, in, in high school, that was like what you would do because <laughs> it was just carbs and carbs give you energy. Like, like this was the 80s, and I would like to say we didn't know any better. I ate bran muffins sure. too and all that stuff, but I was fat, right? But when I fast forward to, uh, 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 well, Cheetos and, <laughs> I guess Cheetos may have some milk in them or something, but anyways, some sort of, of corn chips fried right. in vegetable right. oil, and a diet soda is technically plant-based, other than the chemicals in there. It's but not, it's, it's not a real food. It's not real food, it's exactly. Not a whole food. Right, and neither you nor I would have anything to do with that. And then when you get into the point there about, especially refined plant oils, I am in full agreement with that. 
the vast majority of, of refined plant oils are in the kryptonite zone on the Bulletproof diet because they're extracted, because they're solvent extracted, uh, and because they're damaged, right? And, and where, uh, having looked at the anti-aging stuff that I've done and, and all this, I realized that undamaged oils have a different effect on the body than damaged oils. And usually when you extract oils from plants, you tend to do some damage to them. In your work with, I mean, you looked at Forks Over Knives, you talked with a lot of the people who are in Forks Over Knives. They're the co-authors of the book. Right. Oh, actually, are those two doctors, the Forks mm -hmm. Over Knives doctors? They are. They're not, I know Matt Letterman and Lona Polde uh, are the two doctors that are in the documentary and wrote the book. Got it. So they, I, they, work, they work with Whole Foods. Okay, the Forks Over Knives documentary guys I've met, but I didn't realize that they were, I didn't connect the names with this. So, um, so but you, they looked at original paleo founders, they looked at original mm -hmm. uh, vegetarian, like, like very different things, which is something I really respect about, about the movie and about your book, that you're, you're going in on these things. What, what's your takeaway on like, the optimal amount or, or the type of fat that would be appropriate? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a, uh, an argument or discussion I don't really like to have because we're really trying to get people focused on foods, okay. not the constituents of foods. Carbohydrates, proteins, and fats are the macronutrients. Okay. And uh, then you have vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients are sort of the micronutrients. Mm -hmm. It's, they're all important. But the important thing is to be getting, uh, if you eat real foods, mostly plants, you're going to get the right mix of protein, carbohydrates, and fats. It's just going to be there naturally. Okay. It's not that complex. We make healthy eating far more complex than it needs to be. That's why we only have the two rules. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I eat avocados. They're mostly fat. I love avocados. I eat nuts and seeds. Those are mostly fat. Absolutely. So you talk about not damaging the fat. Well, the least damaged fats are those fats that are still part of the whole food. Amen. <laughs> so <laughs> it, eat whole foods okay. and don't worry about your macronutrients. I love that perspective on it. One of the things that I think has damaged nutrition in the country a lot is this idea that, that macros are, are either calories or these big buckets because whey protein versus soy protein, neither one of them. <laughs> Those are not whole foods. Exactly. They're not whole foods. And you might use one or both of them as a supplement in a small amount to do something that you want to do with your biology. But like you said, they're not whole foods. They're supplemental if you decide to use them. Do you ever use protein powders or any of those other things like that? No. You, you eat whole foods? I eat whole okay. foods. I mean, we get, I believe that the average American, mm -hmm. I mean, my friend Garth Davis wrote a book called Protein Holic, where he documents that on average, the average American eats two to three times more protein than they need. Mm -hmm. And it's actually stressful on our bodies to have to take that protein. Protein that you can't use for, for growing uh, muscles and bones and, 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 and just your whole body that you need to repair, the body has no use for it. It doesn't store it, so it basically has to break it down yes. into energy. And that's a, that, that can cause a, a stress on your kidneys. And uh, uh, we, so we tend to be, Americans tend to be focused on protein because the question I get asked the most often, pretty much in any book signing, is where do you get your protein? Mm -hmm. Where do you get your protein? It's like, Everywhere, because it's in every whole food I eat. Plug proteins like it's there. Just if yeah. only way you can get enough protein, Dave, is if you eat those kind of junk food. Sure, if you're trying to live on a, on cokes and Cheetos, yeah, you're going to be protein deficient. Mm -hmm. You're going to be micronutrient deficient. You're basically going to be sick. Pretty right. much guarantee it after a while, because that's not going to nourish your body. So I, it's it's about eating real foods. You know, one one thing we describe in the book. We do a pie chart of what Americans eat, mm -hmm. and it's very disturbing because 54% of the calories that we eat mm -hmm. come from highly processed and refined foods. 54% of our calories. 32% come from animal foods. The majority of those animal foods are foods that are in from the industrial system, oh, yeah. uh, beef that's been pumped up full of uh, corn and has a lot of marbling fat in it. Uh, 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 Eggs, chickens that are, you know, in, this, in these circumstances that we would not think are, are not certainly not good for the animals and arguably they're not the healthiest animal foods you can be eating. And I don't even think there's an arguably for that statement. If you're eating animals that were fed unnatural diets and you're sticking them full of antibiotics and probably getting some pesticide residues in there as well. That's bioaccumulated. It, 
<laughs> I, I don't eat that kind of food. Good. Period. I do eat animal products, mm. but most of the animals that I eat actually ate the grass that grows in the front of my organic farm. Mm -hmm. And I'm very fortunate, and again, I live in the middle of nowhere, which helps. But it, it is entirely possible to go to Whole Foods and buy grass-fed mm -hmm. meat if you're going to do it. And it is more expensive than industrial meat, which is why you should eat less of it, because protein's a terrible fuel source, right? <laughs> I mean, exactly. I mean, we argue in the book that you should be eating, for your animal foods, you should be concentrating. I particularly believe that, from the animal food perspective, mm -hmm. that uh, like wild caught fish, uh, you've yep. got to be a little careful about the, bio, the bioaccumulation of mercury mm -hmm. and, and uh, PCBs and things like that. However, that's going to be your best source for omega 3s, particularly the long chain omega 3s that are more difficult to get in a 100% plant based diet. Or definitely grass fed beef, particularly uh, if, if, if they've been able to, you, they're going to get a higher degree of omega 3s. They're going to have more micronutrients in it. The, the thing that Again, if you focus just on those macronutrients, protein, and we're ignoring those micronutrients, yeah. and they're extremely important to our immune system and our overall health. So we want to eat micronutrient-dense diets, which, by the way, fresh fruits and vegetables are the highest per calorie, by per calorie, micro-density foods that we can eat. So we're only eating 14% whole plant foods, mm -hmm. and that's what's wrong with the American diet largely. We're eating an industrialized product full of refined foods. The animal foods are industrialized, and we're not eating very many whole, real plant foods. I mean, only 14% of our calories. That's pretty low. It, it's pretty shocking. Although if you, if you take away the, the water from the vegetables and, and you look at like volume instead of calories, I know that if I take a, a plate, and literally this, my daily intake is a plate covered in vegetables, whether they're cooked or not, mm -hmm. and then a, a few ounces of grass-fed, high-quality mm -hmm. meat at most, but then I'll cover it with uh, guacamole, grass-fed butter, uh, which also doesn't get damaged in the processing as well. And I know we probably don't agree all the way on butter, but that's okay, right? Whole food sells butter, so I'm not going to throw down. <laughs> I'm not going to throw down butter. <laughs> there you go. But it, it's also from grass-fed animals, right? Which is important uh, without uh, all the pesticides, all that other like mistreatment of animal stuff. So when I look at that, though, I look at the percentage of calories that comes from, uh, from the plant-based foods. It's probably low just because right. there's so much bulk. Because I think you've left out. So let me make the argument yeah. that, that probably many of your audience have either never heard or are going to reject, mm -hmm. but I'm going to make it anyway. <laughs> That's um, what you're here to do. Well, the foods you're leaving out are the, are the healthy starch foods. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would argue, if you think about, we have a chapter on the blue zones, for example, in the book. Yep. where we talk about all the longest-lived peoples in the world, the five blue zones that have been identified, Okinawa, Sardinia, Italy, Icaria, Greece, Nicoya, Costa Rica, and Loma Linda, California, they all eat a 90% plant-based diet, 10% animal foods on average, on, the, on, the, on a, on a meta-analysis shows that, and they're not eating the processed junk foods, and their primary calorie source is starch foods, whether it be whether it be beans and rice, or whether it be sweet potatoes, or whether it be corn. I mean, all of the civilizations that mm -hmm. we know of in history have based their primary calorie source on starch foods. And it's even, there's evidence that even our paleo ancestors were still getting starch foods in because they were doing a lot of roots. So a lot of yep. sweet potatoes, potatoes, cassava roots, I mean, starchy vegetables, I squashes, things like that. So, I am not opposed to starchy vegetables at all. Well, if you put that on your plate too, you're going to get a lot more calories from plant foods than, than animal foods. That's the key. Th those are higher calorie and... And very satisfying. Th they are. And, and I, nice I clean don't, energy burn too. You don't have that same spike in blood sugar you're going to get when you do uh, uh, refined carbohydrates. That's for sure. And I, at lunch, I usually don't eat those. But at dinner, I'll have sweet potatoes, butternut squash. And on the Bulletproof Diet, we've got the, uh, essentially the, the safe starches. And one of the things that, that I came across in, in my own path is that there are meaningful numbers of people who just respond poorly to the outer part of grains. And there are other people I know who can just eat sprouted grains or whatever that it doesn't seem to do anything to them. And what I did is I, I took certain grains and that had less of so the inflammatory stuff and I put them in that if they work for you go for it mm -hmm. right which is why a lot of people 
uh, who are listening are, are sort of saying, like, would there be any common ground be between these things? But when I read through your book, I, I actually find that there's a huge amount of commonality there, uh, despite the fact that I might eat maybe more avocados than you would on the average meal uh, and have the, the butter side of things. But the, the follow-up there is if, if we agree that a, a plate of vegetables is the way we start and that we have some sort of safe starch that's biologically compatible with you, I think mm-hmm. we're in agreement. The next question, though, is one that's, that's maybe more whole foods based, and, and I get this a lot, and it's how the heck do I pay for all this, right? Because our food supply is so set up to be so industrial where if you're, you're doing the animal protein, it's poor quality animal protein, especially at restaurants. You try to order a plate of vegetables at a restaurant, and they charge you $17 for three spares of, of asparagus, and you tell them, I want a plate of vegetables, and they simply won't do it, even if you offer to pay them $100 usually. It's very hard to just get an actual meal made out of this stuff. How do we do this? How do we fix that? You mean if you don't cook? Oh, I cook at because, home. Because the, tru- <laughs> well, the truth is, of course, that in the Whole Foods diet is a very inexpensive diet. If you are building your diet around whole grains and starchy vegetables, and so let's just throw the gluten out. Let's just okay. take that off the table. My wife's gluten sensitive, so we don't eat gluten in my house. Okay. <laughs> but we still eat, we still eat uh, steel-cut oats. We're mm-hmm. still are gonna eat millet, quinoa. We're gonna, we're gonna have some, some uh, starchy type of foods with most of okay. meals. We eat a lot of sweet potatoes, a lot of, uh, and there's so many different delicious kinds of sweet potatoes. Yeah, sweet potatoes and are we, amazing. And we do uh, lots of, uh, of the winter squashes. They're delicious. And so, and then we both love beans. If you, if you ask Dan Buettner of the, of the Blue Zones, mm-hmm. what, were the, what are the most common things he found between all the different uh, Blue Zone areas in terms of their diet? He said beans and greens. They all eat about a cup of beans a day, and they all eat a cup or two a day of green vegetables. So uh, the good thing I love about what you're saying about your diet, Dave, is you're eating a big, you're having a ton of vegetables. And those are the most nutrient-dense yeah. foods you can eat per calorie. Of course, it's not enough. I mean, on average, a pound of vegetables weighs about, I mean, uh, a pound of vegetables has about 90 to 100 calories in it, if it's not a starchy vegetable. Yes. So if that's all you try to live on, you'd have to eat 20 pounds of vegetables a day to get 2,000 calories, and you couldn't do it. You would starve to death. I was a raw vegan for quite a while, and I had, I bought salad bowls that were like the size of half a watermelon, and I was Mm -hmm. blending and chopping for Mm -hmm. two hours a day. And I did lose weight on that diet. <laughs> That's why I think the starchy vegetables are so yeah. important. I don't think it's very difficult to eat a plant-based diet. And you're either going to have to get uh, a lot of calories from fat or you're going to have to get it from starches. And I think, arguably, that based on the history of humanity, the starch foods... Uh, are the ones that we basically evolved primarily eating. And, and that's, that's what civilizations have all been based on. That's what the Blue Zones do. Uh, if you think about, like, Okinawa, 70% of the elders of Okinawa's calories came from just sweet potatoes, 70%. Mm-hmm. And, they, and then they'd add beans, they add a little bit of fish to that, a little bit of uh, pork when they were doing celebra- celebratory, but about 4 to 5% animal foods in that diet. So... Uh, again, I, I, I'm never going to make the argument, I'm an ethical vegan, but I, I don't make the argument that humans evolved. We evolved as what I'd call plant-based omnivores. Uh, just like chimpanzees and bonobos, mm-hmm. they eat about 95% plant-based and about 5% animal foods, mostly termites and grubs and things like that. But um, they can occasionally get a monkey and they'll tear it apart and eat it. Uh, but I think humans are very similar to that from our genetic closest ones. We, we flourish on mostly a plant-based diet with a little bit of animal foods, and then it's about where you're gonna get your most your calories from. You're arguing for fat for your major calories source, and I'm gonna argue starches mm-hmm. would be a healthier choice and the one that's most proven in terms of longevity. There are, uh, there's abundant evidence to support both of those, one or the other. Where's your evidence of longevity mm-hmm. from eating a high fat diet from, uh, well, it, it I don't turned, see that in the data. Historically, there haven't been societies that were wealthy enough to do that other than in a few like, rulers where they could do that. And then there's the question of what happens with the 
uh, with the processing of the fats and the type of fats. Those seem to be really important. So what I'm looking at here is, is the biochemical arguments. What happens when you have a background level of ketones present where you get rapid reductions in inflammation and you get changes in hormones that are correlated with, long, with longevity. So changes in telomeres, changes in uh, mitochondrial efficiency. One of the five big theories of aging is around uh, losing mitochondrial efficiency and you can actually turn it back on with some ketones. And so I, I'm also one of the people who angers most of the keto crowd who says you have to only be burning fat. I actually believe that a cyclical ketosis diet where you actually do eat the starches you talk about and then you stop eating them and you go into fat and you go into starch and you go into fat because having the body respond to the environment around it seems to keep us younger, almost like exercise does, but you're doing it with food. I mean, I'm not going to argue the biochemistry with you, mm -hmm. um, but I would say that I would say that's largely untested over the long term. So I, you're, you're kind of doing I, a big experiment I here. I don't actually disagree with that. There so, really so aren't I'm, a lot of high fat in, his, in, historical In people. stating my case for, mm -hmm. well, and just using myself as an example, right. uh, I mean, I weigh the same as I weigh. I'm 63, mm -hmm. so I'm not a young guy. But I weigh the same as I weighed when I was 18. I weigh 145 pounds. Uh, my cholesterol is 135. Mm -hmm. My LDL is about 65 to 70. My blood sugar is very low. Uh, and uh, uh, my blood... Very my low, like 80s? Uh, yeah, in the 80s. Okay. My, my and my, um, uh, my blood pressure is like 105 over 70. Although I might say probably recently... Mm -hmm. I'm under a lot of stress, so it might be a little higher right now, but on average... <laughs> but glasses uh, are tough. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, it's an easy diet to follow. It works for people. I've actually... I, you, you said you like for a raw food vegan. To me, that's a... I wouldn't argue for a raw food vegan I diet. I think it's a very difficult diet. It, it gave me Hashimoto's and food allergies. Like it, yeah. it was really rough on my body. But I've seen so many people, when they adapt a sort of a starch-based whole foods diet, Cut the gluten out if that if it works, but you're eating whole, uh, whole grains like steel cut oats, and, and you're eating uh, uh, sweet potatoes and brown rice and things like that. Your your body responds very well to those starches, and then you're going to get some fat along with the diet, and you're eating legumes and beans. You have to change your bio. One of the the, mm -hmm. the big things that's going to be the next frontier. It's already the next frontier is the microbiome. Mm -hmm. What what are we feeding our gut bacteria. It matters so much. And over time, <clears throat> your, your feet, whatever you feed mm -hmm. yourself, your, your bacteria, you're feeding some bacteria and others are dying off. So like a lot of people say they can't digest beans very well because they probably can't because they don't have the bacteria geared up in their system to digest it. Have you heard of Viome, the new service? I haven't. Uh, this is a, a new thing from Naveen Jain, who's one of the uh, one of the guys involved with with Joe Polish and all, and he, they're doing four times a year gut testing to see what fungus, what bacteria, what oh, I'd virus, love, I'd what love phage. To test. Can you send me that information? Yeah, I'll, I'll hook you up with it. I, obviously, clear. I should be a member here. I, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> so I'll I'll make sure to do that intro. And I, I've already talked with Naveen. He was a guest on the show. Okay. So he uh, uh, he would be. Um, uh, he's someone who you should be connected with because then you can see if you start eating beans, okay, do you change your gut bacteria? And the answer is, yeah, the fiber is going to do that. And I, I believe that there's probably also some genetic differences because uh, there are compounds called lectins in mm -hmm. certain foods and like bell peppers, right? Like there are some people who should, like me, I should never eat a bell pepper again. Well, some people have food allergies. There's no, <laughs> yeah. no, some foods we just don't agree with. The lectin yeah. argument's overstated. But it just depends on the biology of the person. I, I know, but, but yeah. most of the lectins say in mm -hmm. beans. I mean, you have to soak the beans. And then you're going to throw the soaking water out. Yeah. And then you cook the beans to make sure they're thoroughly cooked. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't know. And then you, you, your microbiome takes care of it. But and, most I, people handle that pretty well. Yeah. I, I, I do know that after extensive tests with myself, mm -hmm. uh, I get chronic joint pain if I eat beans. Really? But... It doesn't mean that everyone does. It, it has to do with uh, probably mitochondrial DNA, not even nuclear DNA. And it's one of those things where if you don't test it, you'll never know, right? right? And so I, I put the beans in the, you know, it's, it's in a suspect food. You, you gotta know whether you can handle them or not and that mm -hmm. they're worth a, worth a test. And the evidence that you're talking about from the blue zones in right. your book uh, is, yeah, there are long-lived societies that eat beans and there's the, even the Kitavans who are 70% starch and, and live a long time. Mm -hmm. and, and so we, we do have evidence that, that there's a group of people who are 
primarily starch. And we also... We just don't know any societies that primarily eat fat that live a long time. There's no evidence to, well, this, to date on that. Well, let's see. What about the... Probably the, the biggest ones are like the Maori tribes people. The Maasai and the Eskimos Maasai, yeah. are constantly tried, tried out. But yeah. the Eskimos have <clears> the lowest life expectancy in the northern hemisphere. And the Maasai average age is 45 at and death. I, so I'm I not felt, sure those are great examples. No, they're not. And I felt crappy when I did a diet like that, when I was doing the, the research for the Bulletproof diet. When, I you were ate, drinking, when you were mixing blood with your milk? I, I, <laughs> yeah. What I do? It was really hard to get fresh blood, but I found out. <laughs> <laughs> you know a few vampires out there? Exactly. <laughs> the, uh, the interesting thing, though, is I did go for an extreme high-fat diet. I ate one serving of vegetables a day. Mm -hmm. I was eating 80% of my calories from fat and the rest from fish and, and grass-fed meat. And I gave myself some really nasty food allergies I didn't have before. I mean, it, it, was, it was not a good three months. I felt great for the first little while, but then I started waking up without knowing it 12 times a night. My sleep monitoring stuff was telling me, you're waking up, and I would just, I'd sleep 10 hours, and I would just feel like a zombie. And it took me a while to come back from that. So I'm not sure I want to One I thing I really like way. about you, Dave, is you're, very, you're, you're a very experimental guy. You're like a... You're an explorer. You're out there exploring these new frontiers, and you're willing to use your own body as a testing ground. So I think that's fascinating. Well, well, thank, thanks, John. It, it, part of this, I had arthritis in my knees since I was 14, uh, and I was obese, and I had brain fog. It's like I was old in my mid-20s, and I'm not going back to that. <laughs> so like, I'll, I'm willing to try almost anything to make sure that I don't live in that state again, because I just, having been there, I don't want to do that. And... I'm looking to see what works best for me. Right. Understanding that we have this incredible abundance of diversity in our gut bacteria, uh, in, our, in our DNA from our parents, and then in our mitochondrial DNA, that the mitochondria are there to take food and convert it with oxygen into energy for us, right? And uh, there has to be an algorithm that works for most people, and then it's a little flow chart. It says, uh -huh. don't do this if that hurts. <laughs> right. I mean, clearly, I mean, and we're not arguing that people have to, uh, they have to discover what uh, makes them sick. And the problem is, in some ways, the challenge is, is that our bodies now are, are, are sort of messed up. Yeah. And they oftentimes, uh, I mean, if you get addicted to certain foods, for example, you just crave them. Yeah. And, you'll, and, and you're going through withdrawal system, systems, you're not getting so said, well, I have to eat that because I feel good when I eat it. Mm -hmm. I don't feel good when I don't eat it. Well, that's what an alcoholic would say or a smoker would say. <laughs> I, was about I to feel say really that. good when I'm smoking. And after I smoke, I start to get a little anxious, so I smoke again. <laughs> or I feel good after I'm drinking, and then I, get, you know, I don't feel good when I'm not drinking. So we have serious food addictions. We do. And uh, most, people, most people don't want to change their diets. There, there's... Uh, People never get tired of hearing good things about their bad habits because people basically don't want to change the way they eat. Mm -hmm. So they're, they always want to hear things that they want to believe are true. They, there's always going to be a market for people that say, uh, gosh, you know, if you want to eat, if you give up sugar, you can eat all the animal foods that you want. There's a real market for that because that seems like a minor sacrifice. Yep. And but what are the long-term consequences of that diet? I would say not, they're not going to be good for most people. It's, I'll be a little bit more direct from a biochemical perspective. The long-term results of that are cancer. Because when you eat that much protein, it raises mTOR instead of keeping it low most of the time, which is what you want to do if you don't want to get cancer. And so I'm, I'm concerned about that. And I don't overeat meat. And a lot of the, the paleo crowd... You know, big cuts of steak, and right. I do enjoy a big cut of steak. I just know if I eat that on a very regular basis, I'm not going to like how I feel, and I'm probably not going to live as long as I want to live. Speaking of that, how long do you think you're going to live? <laughs> I, I think I'm going to live to be past 100. Okay. I mean, I, you were talking about telomeres. I got my telomeres yeah. checked a year ago, and I was in the 98 percentile. Nice. They said I had like, I was like, you got telomeres of a 12-year-old, and I thought, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, that is really cool. Uh, of a I, I make people so upset. Somebody's probably going to, you know, somebody's probably going to knock me off one of these days. <laughs> Maybe after hearing this podcast, like that <laughs> asshole. I hate that guy. I hate John Mackey. Somebody's got to take him out. He's, you know. 
Well, I, I think, and I've got, I, I'm about, I'm guessing 20 years younger than you, I'm 44. I'm 63. Okay, pretty good guess. Yeah. And we've got a bunch of changes coming. Just, I, I know a lot of the people doing the work now in the anti-aging field. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a good chance of adding, in the next 10 years, adding 20 years to our lives with some of the things we have around telomeres. You know, one of my jokes is that they're going to finally figure out how to stop aging when I get to be 100. <laughs> so I will spend all eternity at age 100. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, there, there's maybe some truth to that, although we, we may be able to reverse yeah, maybe it. Maybe they can reverse it. I'm, for, I'm yeah. all for that. I, I think 180 is achievable. And right now we know that you can get to about 120. Like there are I think the oldest, that. isn't the, I, I always read the, like the oldest person they've documented. Mm -hmm. You know, getting those birth certificates can be tricky because people yeah. lie. You know, they forget to. Right. It's like 117 or something like that. I think there's a 127-year-old out there now. Really? Yeah. I yeah. think she S just passed. Send me that around. information. Right. Okay, I'll, I'll dig that up. Someone just sent it to me the other day. And it, it's it's 120-ish, we'll say. You know, Dan Buettner talked about when he was doing the Blue Zones. Mm -hmm. He said the hardest thing was people lie about their age, and particularly if they want to be perceived as, you know, really oh, old wow. and wise. So he said the hardest thing is being able to document it. Yeah. Being able to get to actual birth certificates and being able to verify that. And uh, uh, that cut out a lot of people, a lot of these yeah. places like the Hunzas, for example, which has mm -hmm. always been held up as this really long Pakistan mountain people called the Hunzas. And, but when they got in there and looked at the, the, the actual birth data, they didn't, make the, cut, there. didn't okay. make the cut. Uh, so I, I definitely know that those are outliers and I don't mind making myself an outlier <laughs> when it comes to longevity. And it sounds like you don't either. Uh, the well, I gotta have some friends to stick around, so I have somebody to talk to. When I'm well, if you want to live a long time, you gotta have some friends, right? Exactly. That's one of the big things. In fact, that was another uh, another thing that that's important uh, in uh, with with all the people that that you worked with on the book is stress reduction, right? Mm. Uh, what do you do? Meditate, do you, yoga. You meditate, do yoga. Okay, how often? Now that is a fair question. Uh, you know, I don't know if I do anything every day except for the basic biological functions mm -hmm. and uh, but I probably meditate uh, four or five times a week okay for a few minutes or an hour or not no my wife is a yoga teacher she meditates two hours and does two hours of asana so wow. I'm hoping her karma is going over for me <laughs> if when I meditate 10 to 20 minutes I actually feel you know it's yeah. it's the quality of the meditation not the length it is and and really uh, the kind of schedule I have to keep in my life. You're a CEO. <laughs> 10 to 20 minutes is, is great, and it makes a big difference. And also learning to control your breath. But those are actual conscious meditation. The real trick, the real trick is to be meditating all the time. Yes. To be fully present in the moment. The mantra I tell myself many times a day, fully present, fully in my heart, fully in my higher self. And... When I can do that out, I feel like then I'm in this relaxed meditative state pretty much all the time. That is an achievement because uh, you're CEO of a, a ginormous company, which can be really stressful. It's a goal. I'm not saying I have to do the mantra many times a day because I've done, if, I, if I was doing it all the time, I wouldn't have to do the mantra, right? All right. You find yourself with a busy mind. You find mm -hmm. yourself in an emotional space that you don't think is necessarily one you want to be in. So I've got to refocus. The, that's, yeah. And that's kind of a meditation. Re yeah. If you're trying to meditate and you find your mind drifting, you go back to your whatever you're concentrating on, mm -hmm. or, or if you're doing, you know, uh, vipassana, you're just observing the thoughts. And I think it's the same way with sort of this living meditation. When you find yourself um, caught up in in difficult uh, negative spaces, then you've you've gone out of the moment. Yeah. You've gone into fear. You've gone into anger, and you, the, the good news is, as soon as you catch yourself, you can go mm -hmm. right back into the into the into the into the relaxed, uh, in the moment space, which is what I try to do. So you drive that awareness. You'll notice when it happens because it sneaks up on you, right? Exactly. Okay. You know, when you're when you're really conscious, when you're higher self, when you're when you're really present, um, there isn't any fear. Mm -hmm. There isn't any anger. Yeah. There's 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 well, there's love, and that's what's there in that moment. How did you learn to do that? I'm still learning how to do that. So. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> um, like anything else, you practice it. I mean, you, you recognize a state of being and you say, this is the state of being that, that I am most fulfilled in, that this is the best state for me, 
and I want to be there all the time. Mm -hmm. And so then you practice it. It's like any skill, you practice it. If you meditate, you get better at it. If you catch yourself in the day in a, in a place of consciousness you don't want to be in, catching yourself allows you to choose differently, choose again, and start over again. And then you get better at it. So it's just, so, I'm just older. I've been, you know, I've been <laughs> practicing, practice. practicing right. a long time. How much energy and time do you spend every day uh, dealing with the voice in your head? Well, of course, the answer is um, when I catch myself with the voice, then I go back into the moment. So I don't know, because uh, I don't know. I, I, that would be a very useful um, wearable. Oh, wouldn't it? <laughs> that, you know, you can, you can, I can, you know, if, if I have a, a Fitbit on or a Garmin or something, I can track my sleep. And so I, I think that's all valuable feedback information. Wouldn't it be great to have something that actually sees your brain pattern and it's reporting you spent seven hours in the, the mind loops that, yeah. that are not, are toxic. That would be, uh, that'd be very interesting feedback. And hey, is there any doubt that they will probably come up with something that measures that and we'll we, be able to wear? We can get that from neurofeedback. I, I run a neurofeedback institute and yeah, you end up seeing more beta and less alpha. So it, it's yeah. hackable, but you look like a real dork wearing that around. I'm, so. I want to just, you know, like wear yeah, my little patch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm looking for uh, other things that are in the whole foods diet. Ah, talk to me, what's your take on fasting? Because we talk about food addictions and all that. I, I fasted in a cave for four days uh, by myself in the desert because I wanted to explore loneliness and hunger as a formerly obese person with social anxiety. Uh, that seemed like a good way to kind of push my buttons and really like break an addiction. I, I, there. I, I, I do periodic fasting, okay. you know, not so much for cleansing, mm -hmm. uh, but um, if I ever think my digestion is getting off for whatever reason, just simply withholding food and fasting for 24 hours or 48 hours makes a huge difference. Now, you know if you fast for three days or longer, you change the system. You stop being hungry. Mm -hmm. So and I've done fasts that last longer than three days, but most of the time my fasts now are more intermittent fasts. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I don't, that didn't feel quite right. I make sure that before I eat anything else, I'm going to get hungry again. I'm going to make sure that, that and fasting is... is is a, is a very good way to do that. Kind of, it's kind of like it. It's like a reboot. Mm -hmm. When you fast, you're almost rebooting your digestive system. You're letting it rest. You're letting it recalibrate. When I first started doing fasting, the thought of it was abhorrent to me because I'd come from a background of you know, being obese and learning that if I didn't eat you know, six meals a day at least, that I would starve to death and I'd have no energy. And the truth was, I wouldn't have. The and it energy. teaches you self control. Yeah, and I, I consider it, breaks, it, really it helps important. break food addictions. Hey, so one thing I think is important in the book mm -hmm. that's confusing to people, what exactly is a processed food? Oh, yeah, let's, and, let's and, go there. And, yeah, and so, well, of course, all food's processed a little bit. I mean, when you cook it, it's processed. Or, or there, And so uh, a, a definition that Michael Greger, Dr. Michael Greger gave that I really like, and we, we took it for our book. So a unprocessed food or a whole food or a real food is a food where Nothing bad has been added to it, and nothing good has been taken away. So, for example, if you do steel-cut oats, okay, well, mm -hmm. they've been processed because they've been cut. Yeah. But there's nothing bad added to it, and none of the fiber, none of the nutrients, nothing's been taken away from it. So that qualifies as a, a real whole food. But if you go down to, say, oatmeal cookies, well, you've still got the oats, but now you've added bad things to it. You've added sugar to it. You might have add, you might have added oil to it. You might have probably added salt to it. Because those are the three things that, mm -hmm. that that people are addicted to: are addicted to fat, sugar, and salt. Those are the three challenges that we oftentimes and I'd say high protein input as well. So that's not a whole food. That's not a real food. You might like cookies, but don't kid yourself. And you might rationalize that you're hey I'm getting some oats here but you're getting bad stuff with it as well. So nothing bad added, nothing good taken away. Got it. Uh, I, I like that definition. And it makes the, it nice and clean and simple. It does. And, and I would say there's, there's probably some arguments around which things are good and bad in different dietary tribes out there. Right. So It, it is tribal, isn't it? It sure is. I mean, <laughs> uh, it's fascinating to me. It's, it's almost like religious tribes. I yeah. mean, people, uh, they're so passionate. They get so angry. 
Uh, they they want to be right. They have the right path, and everybody else is wrong. Yeah. And I mean, I'm arguing for the for the whole foods diet. I think it's well grounded in science, but it's going to evolve because we're going to learn more. And uh, I'm going to evolve right along with it. I I have evolved to less protein than I used to think was necessary. And I used to do Atkins. I, I could lose half my 100 pounds on Atkins, of course, then I'd get all the get it, but excessive get protein. It, but it also comes back. It tends yeah. to come back. It, it kind, of a, kind of like a, what do they call that, a boomerang or a... a yo-yo. Yo-yo, yeah. yeah. yes. I, I've lost a lot more than 100 pounds because you lose 20, gain 30, you lose 30, gain 40, just over and over. And I'm to the point now I don't have fat pants anymore. Like my pants just fit and they always do. And for for a guy with my my health background, 15 years of antibiotics and all that, I never oh, would have thought that was yeah, your possible. Your microbiome might be messed up from that. Oh yeah, well, I, I hope I've restored it mostly. So one thing we like about the whole yeah. foods diet that you know, since we're saying eat real whole foods, mostly plants, you get to eat as much as you want. And is it, coffee a plant? Coffee is a plant. Yes. Just check. <laughs> Coffee's one of those uh, 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 ones that people, uh, the tribes, line yeah. up differently on. <laughs> they do. Uh, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I, I drink decaf, so I'm, re I'm recovering a caffeine addict. I was hooked for many years, and once I got off of it, which was now about 15 years ago, mm -hmm. I kind of got my own, my own energy back. Otherwise, the caffeine was the, creating the energy, and, and then I'd have to... Pay, it, pay back the debt on it. The, the studies on, on coffee are interesting because even decaf, it, it tends to uh, correlate with longevity, where what we're dealing with is the same stuff that's in plants, which is polyphenols. Yes. And so green tea, green tea coffee. Is, green tea is the champ, though, or white tea, compared to coffee anyway. In, in terms of volume, like per cup, you see less, but you, you see a different type of polyphenol mm -hmm. versus the volume of polyphenol. So I like I do both because why not, right? Right. And uh, so yeah, doing decaf is a is a good choice, and I I, I still enjoy my caffeine. I, you know, I I it's, it's maybe one of those things where you, I'm already such a wired guy. Are you? Yeah. yeah it's like giving a hyperactive kid Ritalin. That, it just kind of blows out my adrenals. That's I'm, kind I get, of, it gets me so amped up, and I'm already amped up. That, that's I'm, kind of what Tony Robbins says too. Like he's like, I, I don't, I don't do caffeine because, and his whole team's like, could you imagine Tony Robbins on caffeine? Because <laughs> <laughs> you have that much energy, you have that much energy, right? But you know, I know other, I have other friends who can drink, basically drink coffee all day, and there's this mellow, relaxed people. They go to sleep on it. Yeah. It's like, wow. If I, if I was to drink, let's say I. Go to Starbucks, or and they, I say decaf, and they give me the, and you know, they forget, and they give me the real thing. It's and not a good day for you. No, well, it'll be, it'll be a bad night for me. Okay. Actually, I won't be able to get to sleep at a normal time. I'll be wired. I always joke. If you make that real caffeine, I want your telephone. I'm going to call you up at three in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, we're coming up on the end of our interview. Got to be respectful of your time. One more question for you. If someone came to you tomorrow and they said, John, I want to perform better at everything that I do in my life, not just my job, but like just being a human being, what are the three most important pieces of advice you'd have for them? Well, the first thing I would say is people perform best when they're in sync with their own purpose in life, whatever that is. And uh, I, I, there's a saying that the two most important days in our lives, the first one is the day you're born. Mm -hmm. It's, and the second one is not the day you die, because that's the end of the story. It's your marriage and your birth of your children. Those might be very big, important milestones. But I would argue the second most important day of your life is the day you discover why you were born. Wow. And so when you sync up with your own purpose, then, then every day is an adventure. Every day you're flowing along. You're in the flow space mm -hmm. when you're on purpose. And so that's the first thing I would say. And secondly, life is very short. You, you, I know this because I'm further along towards the end of it than you are, but young people don't really fully understand this in yeah. their gut. They will as they age. And it's so much shorter than we realize. It's too short to do anything except follow your heart, follow the things that you have passion about, because those enliven us, and they give us tremendous energy. And it, it's not an act of will when you're doing things you're passionate about, because you're just flowing along, and the energy flows along with you. So purpose and passion. And the third thing I would say is you just set a high standard for yourself, meaning um, because you want to be excellent, you, you, you expect a lot from yourself. You don't 
make excuses, you don't rationalize things, you hold yourself to a high standard. It doesn't mean you have to beat yourself up, it just mm -hmm. means you're not overindulging yourself. You're basically saying, I'm going to make this day count. This is an important day. This, this could be the last day of my life. I'm going to make it a good one. I'm going to see the beauty in it. I'm going to express a lot of love and share love. I'm going to try to be uh, alive and healthy and conscious. And if you, if you do those every day, and you get into the habit of doing and you get skilled at it, then you're going to live this, your whole life's going to be a big adventure. And adventures are fun. <laughs> That is a profoundly awesome answer, and, and thank you for that. Your new book is The Whole Foods Diet. It's available everywhere books are sold, online, and it's also available at this little grocery store called Whole Foods, right? And you'll get your, probably get your best price at Whole Foods. We got it at, at like 17 bucks. Nice. <laughs> I just took a big a photo next to this giant display it here in Austin, your flagship Thanks. store. Okay. So uh, I would encourage you, uh, if you'd like to see what... Uh, what John thinks, but also the physicians that he worked with on this, who looked at a, a variety of, of different uh, uh, long-lived people, just a different amount of philosophy, that it is different than some of the things I recommend, but it has merit and it's worth your consideration. It's worth reading if you're a biohacker, so check it out. Dave, I'm very appreciative of our partnership and, uh, and uh, Bulletproof Coffee and a lot of our stores are very popular. and. Uh, I thank you for your your wonderfully gracious host. You have a big heart, thank and you. I I salute your adventuresome spirit. It's an inspiration to me. Thanks, John. <laughs>